Reality, a poem. <laughs> Wherein is reflected the unnoted reality of routine poetry. <laughs> reality comes like a thief in the night on little cat's feet with broad shoulders supporting mighty pork loins as they take the road less traveled by mama. <clears throat> Curious, but only the dense fail to realize that man's invented post-survival intellectual world grows and develops just as organically as does the physical natural one. And yet, to be considered an intellectual of the realm, it appears compulsory to condemn it as ar as ar <laughs> aberrant and unhealthy. <laughs> now, this definition is taken from its practice in the city. Criticism, a sure sign that all's well. I'll straighten it out in a minute for those of you that didn't get it. The problem, if you want to call it that, and I do, always with publicly known systematized forms of the mystical quest, is that their maps inevitably become of greater importance to them than is the destination itself. A new law of not stay at home physics. Post survival consciousness abhors a boredom. <laughs> a wolf told a cub as they passed an urban area it's always the meanest son of a bitch running the city, and you can always be sure. The dumbest too. Aberrant and unhealthy. <laughs> well, as that great American philosopher John Lee Hooker said, if it's in you, it'll finally come out. <laughs> Of course, John Lee didn't say how long we had to wait around. But then again, one of his most famous treatises was entitled The Endless Boogie, so. <laughs> common sense, common to a particular place and time, is already so far behind the times as to be generally useless. The king of one court allowed a royal priest, a royal philosopher, a royal skeptic, Skeptic, even a royal critic, and agnostic. But the one thing he would not permit was any sort of new minister he had never heard of before. Oh. Query, what is greater awareness and consciousness, the mystical experience itself even, what is it but the ability to process greater amounts of information? As the knight prepared to take his bride, she raised her veil, causing him to say, Who are you? Another way you can tell that you're in the land of the anti-quest is that the people there believe that any great new understanding will always be serious rather than merely entertaining and interesting. The difference between the physical and the metaphysical. The difference between an avalanche and the understanding of what causes them. And of your objects. That's way too simple. I know and that's why there is. Such a blinding distinction. <laughs> the street corner, corner declaimer declaimed, There is nothing wrong with man that a little death won't cure. <laughs> as he became more and more well known as a public mystic, this one man began adding more and more R's to his name. You can tell that an area has truly become civilized if they sometimes close down Saturdays for the weekend. A man looked in the mirror and declared, we only dislike that which we do not understand. And his reflection replied, hey, don't look at me. Time for another city time definition. Psychology. An attempted verbal excuse for being alive and in the way. In one metro area was one chap who used to collect rags and refuge, but has now moved up to fears and tremblings. <laughs> Not as profitable as dread and morality, but more so than aluminum cans. Oh. The secret sage told some of his invisible followers, 
Earthly metaphors suck. But men can more easily hear fables of foxes than they can about faraway worlds. The local god of one reality smiled at this and admitted that were it not so, he wouldn't even exist. There was a man who for many years stood by a fire and never noticed anything but the smell of the smoke and certainly never suspected he was at a launch site. How it goes, still. How it goes. Too soon do the ordinary often believe they begin, and certainly so do they generally end. Modern discoveries in cosmology as seen from a certain perspective. Where there's smoke, there's fire. Except in those galaxies where they have smoke without any fire. This is also why some subatomic physicists, physicists say that you can't go home again if, A, you never left, or B, your wife ran off with the mailman. <laughs> In one land of sheep, they let the baddest sheep be king, and the saddest sheep be priest, and the most confused one, philosopher. And the, and the most alert one got away. <laughs> That's right. He went far away. All the way into the future. The relationship of advertising to purchasing, you, to purchasing used as a metaphor for that between education and the intellect. Advertising has but two tasks. One, to tell you why you need that which you don't. And two, to explain how they can sell it to you for less than it costs them. <laughs> As the shell was hurled from the fiery mouth of the cannon, it exclaimed, You call this entertainment? In a recent ad seeking new people for the area of mysticism, part of the sales pitch was in noting that the position of mystic is about the only one in which you can become well-known without becoming popular. <laughs> Psychology placed in its proper sequential setting. The subconscious mind of man's, the subconscious mind was man's mental hobby before the development of worry beads and the rosary. <clears throat> Metaphysical chronolo chronology brought up to date. The truth lasts one generation, reality one and a half. Mm -hmm. A certain future thinker, already as a matter of fact forgotten by most, once described this sort of activity as mathematics for those only recently departed. Two guys were talking on the corner and the first one said, you know the song I really like, Everything Old is New Again. And his buddy replied, yeah, I kind of like it too, but even more so since I forgot it. And they both grinned and gave each other high doo-wops. <laughs> if, if the healthy entertainment of the body is in doing, in the experience, then it would seem to follow that that of the mind would be in thinking. But, not so. Not even possible. It has to be in a combination of an understanding and an experience. Two guys talking. Once you get past the monitoring post-survival level of neural intelligence, what difference does it make what you think about then? Another guy didn't know either. Only the badly uninformed are satisfied to remain earthbound. An emotional mystic is like a warrior headed into battle already partially blinded. A viewer writes, I think I'd enjoy your, more, your show more if you'd pick out one subject and stick to it. P.S. <laughs> P.S. Just what is the subject? Yours, etc. One man had some custom flaps on his mind. Sort of like emergency buttons and escape hatches on elevators. In a surprising, one-of-a-kind legal maneuver in a certain city, 
One property only suddenly foreclosed on himself and all of his mortgage doors. <laughs> Another signpost that accurately can determine that you are still in the kingdom of the semi-dense adventure is that the people around you do not yet believe that part of its proper function is the higher relief of neural boredom. <clears throat> Our inspirational interlude for the evening and just in time. If you smile just before you die, one of two things will occur. Either you won't die or else death will wipe that smile right off your face. <laughs> Since cows and sheep and dogs can't be mystical... They become religious. <laughs> hey, viewer writes, if that guy on your show would wear a suit and tie, I think I could listen to it better. <laughs> Cheap entertainment. If you look on the ground long enough, you'll always find something to pick up. <laughs> One father tried to explain it to his son. In real mystical data, there is no secret message. Well... There is, but it's not so much actually secret as it is, well, I guess you could call it secret if you wanted to. <laughs> and the lad didn't bother to tell the old man again how much these little talks meant to him since, well, <laughs> since, well, you know. A mama bird reminded one of her little birdlings, cats have a bad attitude. And that's all there is to say about it. Well, that, and to remind you that we all, somewhere in the past, swallowed a cat. Uh, cliches cleaned and expanded while you wait. Minds, I mean men, with too much slack, always want even more cut for them. Under a nom de plume, one philosophical author wrote critical analyses of his own work. <laughs> Note, the title of this item could have been, How Things Could Be, In the Land of Three or More. By the diving board in one city park was the notice, the public pool reserved for twits. <laughs> All sheep need companionship. Some sheep need more. Some sheep need many sheep for the purpose. Some need less. Sir Lancelot's sheep has unique needs. Yeah. Only equals can equally entertain one another. And yet, another clue that tells you that you're still roaming the land of Philistine mystics is that they continue to consider that art should be a reflection of merely survival instincts and thus seriousness. <clears throat> After permitting the boy to attend city schools for a considerable length of time, the old man one day forcefully removed him therefrom, took him to some woods near their home, and continued his education with these, yes, these words. Regardless of what they told you over there, well, what they had to tell you, and what I knew they'd tell you, now you listen to me. If you do load a library of books onto a camel's back, he will become educated. <laughs> and if you save a scorpion's life, he'll always remember it and never sting you. <laughs> and pigs will fly if you stick jet engines up their ass. A viewer writes, after listening to you for some time now, I am developing this strange suspicion that if you can somehow redefine everything in some sort of new and unexpected manner, it might just all go away. <laughs> A man asks, if the universe is closed, then if I fire off a shot, it will eventually return and strike me in the back of the head, Correct. And the royal scientist said, correct. And the royal priest replied, correct. Although from a different view. And the royal Barnum added, indubably. 
And the man's own regal insight whispered to him, get the hell out of here. <laughs> you can always make a living giving guided verbal tours of mystical launch sites, just as long as you don't bring the crowds in too close. <clears throat> An obscure aristocratical chronology. One king originally agreed to sit for an oil portrait, then later agreed to sit for a photography session. <laughs> then even later agreed, nay, insisted he sit to be shot. <laughs> Such excellencies, as you might suspect, are seldom noted by history. And now a reading from the New Tales of Exodus. Pigs only remember the lands of slop. And now an adage update. Ask not from whence the noise cometh, it cometh from thee. <laughs> One night proclaimed, forget dragons, I'm going to slay me some sheep, and forth went, with went to his room. <laughs> I trust we won't be hearing any buying coming from certain people's. <laughs> when mystical activity is actually alive and meaningful, its real name then is futuristic, just as it's always been. Science news from the areas of cosmology and subparticle physics. Some experts believe that the external world exists totally apart from man's mental perception thereof, while others claim it only exists therein. And yet a third group of gypsy knights and drag want weekends declared national holidays. <laughs> In a gross mix-up in communications in one city ballroom, after the orchestra leader counted off the song, instead of the band playing, Mission Control launched them into orbit. <laughs> Whee! cried the second chair sax player. <laughs> in the forms of transcendental practices and philosophies that seem accessible to ordinary people, the maps must always appear to be of much greater importance than any map has a rational right to be vis-a-vis -vis its purported purpose. Dad, is that how you can tell? Yep, son, that's how. What do you get when you fill up a pig with mystical ideas? A sausage. At any... At any really alive performance, the printed program is already out of date. <laughs> Today's nights are not on horses, but ride instead rocket forces. The distinction between public forms of mysticism and the unrevealed variety. The really hip never seem hip. Unchained consciousness appears effortless. Pick up a piece from last time. If you recall, there was uh, taken off on a news item that said that the conscious drug, consciousness drug of choice for the simple, that is ordinary people, is aspirin. And we talked about it several ways, but I wanted to be sure, sort of a little wrap up, and I get on to what I was going to do is that in the, in the fact that collectively, that all men, not instances such as this, are not, matters not, that all sane men are being driven by life itself over the generations to an open-ended, non-stop, never conclusive expansion of their own nervous system, the mind. So therefore, men are continually feeling as though they have a headache, physically and metaphorically that they continue to feel, this is it. This is where, that's one of these signs, as you know, that you are, in fact, civilized. I mean, anybody can afford to have a cancer, Jesus. But to be able to have a neurosis, no education. You can have leukemia, and third grade dropout, very poor. You can have all kinds of, you can break a bone out in a trailer park. But when you start moving up toward the penthouse and you move into better sections of town, that's when you start having people with phobias. All right. So you have 
the continuing sense of there being a headache. And part of the little humor that I intended to get you to look somewhere else is me saying aspirin, since it is about as innocuous a drug and would seem to have no bearing upon one's consciousness, it indeed does once you see that aspirin is routine thought, such as saying what kind of guy you are. It's in any way that you accept and that you repeat, that you play along with, that you are a participant in whatever the going general mindset is there, whatever you say. It could just be a cliche, an adage, just a comment. It could be that. That's the aspirin. But one of the great ones is to do, is tell what kind of guy you are, because as long as you keep repeating that, it is that you are taking history and flogging it in a way that would make a 17-year-old boy, playboy, look like a muck. <laughs> I don't, never mind. But it is a continuing attempt not to let life give you that kind of continuing headache. And so you take, that's why it's, I pointed out and used aspirin as being the most innocent as far as expanding consciousness, if we had a bunch of druggies here, which I know you guys, I know it's kind of foreign to you, but I, theoretically I assume you understand that you would think aspirin, you know, you can get high off probably drinking lighter fluid before you could aspirin to affect your consciousness, or at least affect it, but no, no, no. It is the most innocent things in the world that are the consciousness drugs of choice because ordinary people, not that there's anything inherently wrong with a little drugs or alcohol, that's not the point, but ordinary people who can say, well, I do not even like to drink, or I, I understand too much to go drink if I am actually depressed or to take drugs. That's not the way to do it, which sounds fine. That sounds as though it'd be one of the benchmarks of being more civilized. But what they do do, from, our, from the view of trying to transcend the city limitations of thought, is whatever they do that's ordinary, whatever gets them through the night, to refer to another great philosopher, <laughs> By some reports, Daniel Hooker's illegitimate son, Chris Christopherson, but it was hard to... We're getting way off the subject. <laughs> but ordinary people, their, their view is they've adopted whatever, you know, help me make it through the night, whatever gets you through the night. But what gets most people through the night is what? Aspirin, which, which means what? Being themselves. That, well, I'll think the same thing. It doesn't matter what. You can think, well, boy, life sucks. And that might be what gets you through the night. You can get you through the night again, metaphorically, it may just get you through that immediate moment. It may be that something apparently out here in life happens, and calling upon all of your deep, insightful, philosophical resources, and you're about to get the world's most gigantic headache, that they say, we're not going to take this back. You bought this over six months ago. <laughs> and you're about to get this horrible headache. Or they ask you a question like, how can you explain your behavior? And you go, same to you. <laughs> That's aspirin. Or screw you. Or God bless you. Or well, I guess we all have our crosses to bear. Or stars of David. Or you know, pictures of Buddha. It is all aspirin. But I, I want you to see that. I know when I had here tonight, I know it got a little dense as it went along. I'll reread it as promised. Thank you so much. Curious, but only the dense fail to recognize that man's invented post-survival intellectual world grows and develops as organically, just as organically as does the physical natural one. And yet to be considered an intellectual of the realm, it appears compulsory to condemn it as aberrant and unhealthy. Uh, anybody likes hints for the last four or five times we've been meeting, I have been, I think I already hinted, some of you trying to give you a hint upon a hint, and this is close to it, although I'm not using the same terms I did, so there. I hope that spoiled your aspirin. I hope if you try to think aspirin now, you look down, it's got this kind of green slime on it, and you're, you're somewhat hesitant to think it. Uh, you recall several nights ago, we were mentioning that amongst artists, that creative people of all sorts, that the ultimate insult is you sold out. On a wider level, just civilized ordinary people, one of the greatest insults in the world is it's unnatural. And here's the way it goes, what this one was. That people do not realize 
they're not supposed to, but what appears to be civilization, although we've got two forms, you've got what appears to be external civilization out here, which I was wrapped it all up, it is the external, invented, concocted, civilized world of man. Just for the time being, that's our temporary map. That is opposed to what ordinary people think of the physical. But anyway, one, one thing at a time. <laughs> you got civilization internally and externally, but then you have what appears to be the civilized world as opposed to the invented world, as opposed to the natural world. And I point out that the man's invented world, civilization as opposed to nature, grows, although people do not see it ordinarily, it grows as organically, and I assume you all know what organically means, it actually just grows as organically as does nature, as, as do trees, as do the animal world. And yet people do not see it, which is one thing, but on top of that, not only do they not see it, but to be considered intellectual, you have almost as compulsory to condemn it, at least periodically, you don't have to all the time, but you must periodically find fault with it. To wit, can you imagine any civilized person who has no bad word at all for civilization? You can think for a second. Shouldn't take you that long. <laughs> to be civilized, you have got to be a critic. To some degree, I don't mean you have to be a professional sorehead. <laughs> but you would never pass, if you suddenly were dropped into a position of some academic intellectual authority at some great university, just suddenly drop there and there you are, and you get through your classes for a week or so, and then you go to the weekly cocktail party at Friday afternoon at the dean's house, and people start talking to you, and they find out whatever they bring up, whatever the subject is. The growing frailty of tenure, the problem of conservatives taking over local government, uh, the lack of rise in interest rates on security, not, uh, federal security, whatever it is. And this one guy, they talk to him, whatever his department is, but just ordinary civilized conversation. And he never adds any comment of any criticism. He just, he's pleasant enough, but he never seems to participate. Or if he does, it is never on the basis of, yes, I've thought of that. And it strikes me that what we need is some, just anything, I'm just making it up, you know, as I go along. But he might say, well, it strikes me is what we need is actually some younger blood on the Federal Reserve Board. Or just anything. But he never says anything in way of criticism. That is not civilized. They would begin to find him spooky, and they wouldn't know why. They just begin to doubt his intelligence. You literally have got to be, at least in part, a critic of civilization to be civilized. I wanted to point out, it's just as many as I can think about, but I brought up this one once or twice before in other contexts, back to the first part of the paper which is not a criticism of civilization, and it's certainly not a criticism of people, is to get you to see that right before your very eyes, and you're part of the very eyes, it's around you, you're in it, and etc. of what appears to be this invented world that's in some way different from the natural world. Well, you do know, I mean, it's plain enough, you're not going out in the woods. None of you, I assume, would ever hold your breath even though all the elements are there somewhere, out there that you go out in your backyard or off into the woods or off into the deserts, and at one time, be lightning, there'll be rain, there'll be movements of the earth, and the plates will shift, and suddenly just everything will come together, and one day you walk there, and suddenly, just out of nowhere, just naturally has been produced a computer. I mean, surely nobody will wait. Or a telephone, or a television set, an automobile. That you think, well, it's plastic, it's wood, it's sand, it's silicon, it's everything, it's right here in this area. But you know, man has to go there and put it all together. And men find it in varying degrees. We're not talking about now psychotic, non-middle class people. I'm not talking about somebody just constantly bitching. I'm talking about ordinary, civilized, sane, educated people. They do not complain all of the time. But even they will agree that there is something distinctly different between the natural world and man's invented world. Mm -hmm. And that part of man's invented world, 
for they won't agree to this or not, is the second part of that. For them to uphold any position of being considered an intellectual of the realm, of wherever they are from, wherever the position they try to hold, they have got to, at the proper times, find fault with the former, with the civilized world. Men hold the civilized world, man's invented world, they hold it to a different standard than they do a natural world. Men do not, they hold paintings to a different standard than a tree. They hold symphonies to a different standard than they do the song of a bird. That if you're civilized and ordinary, it's almost impossible. I mean, you're getting to the point of being a little unstable to actually find fault with the natural world. <laughs> Whoever criticizes the natural world, any sane person. Now, they may not be a great outdoors person or something, but you're not going to find a civilized person. You might say, boy, how do you like rap music? And they go, God, it drives me nuts. And you say, yeah, but have you ever heard a cuckoo sing? Have you ever, have you ever heard a robin, especially one that's a little on the chunky side? That, that drives me nuts. Or you can say, have you seen the pre-post deconstructive, reconstructed uh, American existentialist, non-representational <laughs> school of New York painting that's currently hot. And the guy goes, yeah, God, that stuff, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hang one of those in my house, you know, if they gave it to me. They're paying big money. All right, same thing, but can you look outside and go, have you ever seen such a damn ugly mountain? Look at that son of a bitch out there. You see that big tall one over there on that range? You see the one right in the middle? And the guy goes, you're right. God, I'll never look out the window. It's nuts. You understand? A tree. Anything that seems to be natural is a different standard, and it is literally. Well, I shouldn't even play around. You have got to be outside the mainstream to seriously <laughs> critique what, what we're now calling, or what ordinary people do, the natural world. So the standard of man's civilized world, the world of technology, automobiles, painting, I didn't mean just the arts. But people criticize cars. How ugly. I can't stand anything that Ford made. I can't. <laughs> Whatever it is, as long as man made it, it is held to a different standard. And nobody analyzed. They just accept it. I was going to use back to the first part. That this invented world from the arts, all the technology, civilization itself does, though, grow organically. And it would seem to be, right, as far as I've taken it thus far, I could get ordinary people to probably want to say, wait a minute. You're already getting off the track because man's invented world is not organic. It does not continue to grow and like it's a, a natural progression from one part to another. And it's like in the animalistic sense that one grows from an embryo and all the organs develop. And it's a natural sequence. It's a continuing progression. It's, the parts are all related to the whole. No, no, no. You're talking about trees. You're talking about actual animals, little bunnies and humans. But not art, not music, not civilization, not the law. Not theology. It just, I mean, it's some kind of, it's not natural. I mean, some of it's all right, we need it. But it is not the same thing. You cannot say that that grows and develops organically. What do you mean I can't? <laughs> all right. I was going to pull out an example. It's just, since we've used it before, uh, traffic court. Now remember, this is not a criticism, but I want you to see how life grows organically. And it's also tied, that's why I've been bringing up here of late again, conspiracies. And people's idea that there are conspiracies going on in the world. Of course, I've already slipped up and told you the secret indirectly. There is a great one. It's called the stupid conspiracy. <laughs> Even assuming that I've got a list, don't ask me how I got it, of all those that are part. I am not going to make it known publicly yet. Just don't piss me off. <laughs> anyway, listen quick. And don't get hung up on the subject I just, or the example. Uh, traffic court. The term, traffic court. That would seem to be with well, the laws, the judicial system, but our legal system is at the very heart of civilization, of all sorts. Not just here in our country, but I'm using traffic court. It's an, obviously an English, Anglo-Saxon word. So if any of you people are listening in another language and don't understand this, translate for yourself and you figure out what all that meant. <laughs> Laws are at the very heart of holding civilization together. It is at the heart of anything above the post-survival level of humanity. 
And we all know what courts mean, just in a general sense. It's not a critique of the legal system, but we all know what courts mean, a place to go get justice, to argue your case and to get justice. For somebody to listen and either a jury or a judge, someone, make a determination based on the facts, based upon the laws as written, not their whims, a place to get justice based on the law. Traffic court has nothing to do with the judicial system. It simply does not. Well, anymore, well, if you want to expand a little bit, I know police have different jobs at different times, but assuming at any one given area, state or a county, that there is one group of policemen that are in charge of the traffic laws. They're not in charge of defending the laws of the state any more than the traffic courts are responsible for or involved with dispensing justice. Mm -hmm. The traffic court is a misnamed tax office. Mm -hmm. The policemen enforcing traffic laws are tax collectors. <laughs> but now listen, I guess, and people know this. I'm probably, nobody's probably ever explained it in particular this way, but at any rate, go down and stand next to traffic court and there'll be people that show up. It happens constantly. And there it is, it says, you know, traffic court. And people, they're attorneys, but people that get appointed or elected, or appointed, I guess, but to a traffic court, they'll wear little black robes many times, and they like to be called judge. And it's like, well, I am, I'm here as a judge. They're a tax collector because all you got to do is go down there. I don't have any figures, but trust me. Uh, 99, over 99% 99 of everybody that goes in there and comes out the door alive was found guilty. <laughs> But now listen, now remember this is not an attack. I want you to see how life works. Stand there and you'll listen. Goes on constantly. Just pick out any, there'll be, stand there a few minutes and coming out will be somebody that had a ticket, say for making an illegal turn, speeding. And they'll not only come out, there'll be four or five other, and we're talking about well-dressed, middle-class people, suits and ties. And it turns out that this guy was so upset on the basis of justice, not the money. He found out, you know, that he could find out he could send in the fine for Let's say speeding, 10 miles old limit, it was 50 bucks. But he had people in the car. He was on the way to work, and he had these four people. <laughs> and when the, they saw the light, he went, what? Or the, let's say a left turn, illegal turn. And he got four people in the car. They will swear he did not do it. Okay? They took off from work. Who knows we're talking about good middle class professional people between the five of them. Let's say they collectively, beside, <laughs> remember, he got paid it 50 bucks, but he was in, it was unjust. So he got his four friends. They understood. They were there with him. He said, I'd do the same for you. And they agreed. Well, so let's say they probably, between them, they might have blown $1,000 in pay. <laughs> Going down there and have to sit there in that traffic court. And the guy, or the woman there in the robe, they call your case and comes up. And the policeman said, he turned left. He looks down at the thing. He says, I uh, saw the suspect. And he turned left. And it says, a sign right there. It says, no left turns. And he turned left. And I stopped and gave him a ticket. It was probably at 7 o'clock. And the weather was clear. And the judge says, well, thank you, Sergeant so-and-so. And he says, well, do you have anything to say? Do you, how do you, wait, they, you've already pled not guilty. And she says, all right. Or he says, what do you have to say? And you say, no, I don't, I was driving there. I didn't turn left. I wasn't going that way. I did not turn left. I did not, I didn't even turn left. And I've got witnesses. <laughs> and the judge says, well, all right. And so four people come up. And they, they clean, dressed up, got good suits. And they say, we were in the car, and he did not turn left, where the officer said he did. And, that, and finally, you know, get through five people, testify. And the judge said, would you have anything else to say? And the guy says, no. And he says, guilty. And they say, no. <laughs> now, here's the point. And you stand outside, and you'll see middle-class people, sane people, five people standing out there. Well, one of them's really upset. The guy really thought he got screwed. And then the other four, his friends, they're, now they're a little pissed, but plus they're pissed they came off from work and it did no good. And if you talk to them at all, they're pretty hot. I mean, and they obviously, they saw, they'll be talking like, how can they call this a court? The judge sit there and heard five of us. Did they think that five of us took off work? Why didn't you, he let us tell them, you know, what we do for a living? He couldn't see that we're honest people. Does he think that five of us came down here just to get out of a $50 fine and came down here and lied, took a half a day off? What is this? This is not justice. Well, it's not a court. <laughs> it's a tax office. <laughs> but listen, that's not, but now here's where it gets what I want you to see. This was not a conspiracy. Not at some time did attorneys, as conspiratorial and snake-eyed as some of them may look. 
attorneys did not sit around, politicians did not sit around one time having a few drinks, you know, doing something, and think, what can we do to really annoy the public again? <laughs> what can we do to screw our fellow man again? Now that we've got a little position of power, how can we go? <laughs> I mean, imagine now right quick, I'm not going to try to give you a history because you ought to be able to do this. The, the invention, the development of the automobile. Remember, this had to come first. Let's say we're talking now in real populous areas, New York City, you know, 1890. I don't know even when the first traffic laws were enforced. But I know for a while, they had to let it just go along. I don't know how life works. And they had no laws. The horses there were sharing it with the streets with the cars. And there weren't that many cars. And finally, they, cars started hitting horses or cars started hitting people. And the cars getting traffic jammed. So the city fathers of New York had to sit down and go, all right, we're going to have to say everybody got to stay on the right side of the road like the horses and start that. And plus, we need to say they, should, they can't go any faster than a horse. And then somebody said, well, maybe... Because they didn't have speedometers, I'm sure. But they said you can't go any faster than a horse can travel. You understand? It grew organically. Nobody sat there and go, and it kept getting more and more complex. It is now to the point that uh, in the criminal code of any state, I hadn't counted it, but there'll be a sizable number of traffic laws. But now to begin with, now we're stretching it back all the way from the court. seems to be one place, but how about over here to what appears to be part of that same system? I'll point out the obvious to you again. In the sense of them not wanting to, or in the sense of the laws being that serious, when they pass laws and say, uh, it will be illegal in the state here of Oklahoma to drive faster. Of course, on the interstates, they've got to go by fair law. But they say the state highways, you can only go 55 miles an hour and in increments over that, you will be found for every five miles over it, you'll be found $50. And so you could think, well, they don't want us to speed. Well, you could say that, but they didn't want you to speed, actually. And, of course, somebody, the governor, somebody would come on and say, we have got to stop this speeding. Or drunk driving, maybe that sounds worse. If you, are, if you drive under the influence, if you are impaired and you're driving through the intake of chemical substances such as alcohol, you, the first, upon your first conviction, you will be found uh, fined up to $1,000, and your, your license can be suspended for 30 days, etc. And then after, and they go on for three or four times, and, of course, a good attorney can... You'd be surprised, right? And definitely. And you can say, but that's serious business. And the governor will say, we, this is, we're going and start enforcing this law because we have got to stop this slaughter on our highways, which you can be pretty sure it's an election year if he's saying that. <laughs> and you can say, well, that's true. Well, it's not true. I mean, if they wanted to stop people driving while drinking on the highways, just for instance, then upon first conviction, they would take your car away and put you in jail, say, for two years. Second conviction, they'd take your car away and kill you next Friday. <laughs> shoot you. <laughs> All they got to do is pass that law, and nobody is going to drive drunk except the insane. And we need to shoot them, get them off highways that way. But no sane person anymore is going to drive while under the influence. Same thing with parking violations, whatever. It is, it is like selective enforcement. It is selective enforcement, but it's part of an organic ongoing process. None of this is a conspiracy. No one sat down. I'm sure I could have put it a certain way and had ordinary people listen to this and go, I knew it. It's a damn conspiracy, which shows, see, that they're part of the stupid conspiracy to think that ordinary humans are that smart. <laughs> see, that's why that I was hinting that most people that believe in conspiracy, most. <laughs> why most people that believe in conspiracy, well, so I don't offend all of our you know, viewers out there who are big conspiracy buffs. That anybody that believes in a conspiracy they can identify, they're part of one. That's stupid conspiracy. You've got to remember that because if they can see it, you know, if they go, I see it. I know what they're doing. Can you imagine how stupid that the people they find are? Anyway, you're supposed to figure that one out. It was not a conspiracy. Here's the thing. It grew organically from the point of there being no such thing as a car. 1879. I'm just, whatever it is. Then there's a car. Then there's 10 cars in this one area. Then they start having to do traffic laws. As they say, to protect you know, the welfare of the people on the highway. It grows, it grows. Nowhere along the line did anybody or any group sit around and go, you know what, let's do. We've got so many laws on the book. Uh, instead of us really trying to enforce all these laws that much, let's just kind of let it slide. We won't really shoot people if they speed three times in a row. I know your old brother-in-law said we were to do that. And this, I'm talking like some legislators sitting around, or the governor of some state. They go, no, nah, let's don't do that. Let's go ahead and just let people break the law, and we'll put out some cops there to stop them. And we'll start finding them. 
And we'll call it, well, you broke the law, so it's a fine. It's, you know, you'd rather that and go to jail, hadn't you? And if somebody had the speeding on the way to work or to a funeral, go, well, yeah. <laughs> and we'll just pick up new money. You know, it's new money in our pocket to spend. <laughs> Dole it out and we'll stay in office that much longer. It happened. It is now something other than what it's named. I'm just picking out one thing out of I could have used art. I could have any part of civilization. But this is just a great one because it seems to be, in many people's minds, well, as I said, the laws are the backbone of civilization in the normal sense. And so here's an example. Traffic court. And people that go there find it to be misnamed. They say, I do not get justice. Something's wrong. There's nothing wrong. They're right if they say, well, that's not a court. Of course, they would say it allegorically. They do think it's a court. They call him judge. He's got on a thing. He's sitting up there with a hammer. He says, guilty. You pay your fine. He's got a bailiff there. He's got armed sheriff's deputies. Do it is a court, but allegorically go, I didn't get justice. It's not a court. It's a tax office. And they even say, people had been there. Over and over again, there's been number one wants to say, I sit there for two hours and not one person was found not guilty. And they go, something's wrong here. <laughs> well, yeah. You understand why I say, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. They do not understand that the civilized world grows organically. See, the thing is, humans, since there seems to be this complete, this distinct line between the organic, that is the natural world, let me call it that again. The natural world of trees, just nature, flowers and birds and bees. That that seems to be something that just happens. It's just there. But the civilized world, and it's all, every aspect, anything that you do not naturally find out under a tree, under a rock. Telephones, automobiles, airplanes, computers, television sets, CD players, clothes, chairs, carpet. Anything that you do not find naturally, then it is man-made. But once it is man-made, then people, if they try to analyze it all, they've never done it in this way, they find it always open to criticism and a different standard, and they do not believe. Nobody even thinks about it growing organically in the same way that trees and bird life does, or the spread of kudzu. They do not see that civilization happens because man apparently invents it, and therefore men, especially at each other, not themselves, but they hold each other responsible. Mm -hmm. Did you see that guy called himself a judge? We had five witnesses that said that cop was wrong. And as soon as he says, is that your last witness? You remember? And they're all going, yeah. As soon as you says, is that your last witness? By the time I said, yeah, he went guilty. Next. <laughs> they hold him responsible that something is wrong here. That, that guy's not a judge. He's not, he's not trying to dispense justice. You have got to, there are two levels of this, if I can tie it any better together, remember, that the dense, that is ordinary people, and they're not supposed to see otherwise, but they do not realize that the civilized world, politics, no matter where it is, I know that there are places right now, and it's always true, there are areas of the world that are undergoing great upheavals and pretty swift shifts from you know, a fascist regime to a would-be democracy, and then into a would-be socialist, and then back to the old guys are back in charge. That there's always something going on, and apparently, now remember the, what we're comparing it to, that apparently compared to the natural organic world, this is something else. The ultimate insult being, it's unnatural. It's, it's inauthentic. It's invalid. That is when you disapprove of it. Well, that's not sarcasm. It's because you don't disapprove of all of it. Let's assume that you're a middle class uh, Italian Christian Democrat then you find the Christian Democratic Party, good. You find the life in Italy, you know, pretty good. As long as your, your guys are in power, as long as the, most of the ministers are Catholic, you know, which I assume you're Catholic, that seems all right. But if there is any place to find that life deserves distinct criticism, perhaps even interference by other people, like invade somebody else, or go there and slap them around, tell them to straighten out, it's on the basis of what? Civilization, not the natural world. I, as far as I know, the Italians have never threatened the Sicilians like, if you don't stop that damn volcano down there, if that thing erupts one more time, we're going to come over there and whip your ass. That's ridiculous, right? And yet they say, wait a minute, you people can't start. I know some of you start fooling around with Protestantism. You better watch it over there. You're not that far from us. 
We'll come over there and take you apart. You stay, you, know, you stay with Mother Church. That seems all right. Because it is a different standard. And men hold other men responsible for civilization as though, well, men, men sit down somewhere. I never thought about it, but you're right. They sit down somewhere and thought, hey, we got people by the short hairs and they get a traffic ticket. Most of them won't even show up anyway if we say, well, speeding, you can mail it in, it's 50 bucks. Most people nowadays, they'll send in 50 bucks rather than come in here and fight it. But if they do, <laughs> here's what we'll do, no matter what happens. <laughs> No matter what happens, you know, we'll put your brother-in-law and whoever else we want to as judge, you know, guys that we're about to disbar anyway who are going to retire, put them up there and just teach them one thing. They nod and go, is that your last witness? You go, yeah, and they go, guilty, next. That is the feel. That's the feel of people who are anti-religious or anti some particular religious group or some cultural group or some nationality. It's that same way they feel as though these people... You know, their culture, their religion, their politics, whatever it is they're doing, their music, their art, their judicial system. Anything I don't like, you are holding responsible. And the ultimate, where I started some of this, I wanted you to see, when it gets down, especially to an individual level, it is one of the great insults is to say you're, you're unnatural. Not just you personally, but your life. Well, the syndrome many of you are the dynamics many of you saw which is an old one, but like the uh, 60s, and I know it's variations of it now, but like the hippie commune attitude of, all right, we'll all go out and live off the, we won't have any TV. I'm going to go buy, we'll all get together and go buy some land, and we'll live in trees or under rocks, and we'll all wear natural clothes, and we won't eat anything that's fried and fat. We won't eat any fast foods. That kind of feeling, we'll let our hair grow, and we won't ever bathe. <laughs> and then somebody else comes buying a car, you know, polluting the air, driving real fast, and they're throwing a beer can out the window. An unnatural life. I understand what they're saying, you do too, but you understand that from that level is the supreme kick in the umlauts. The same way as telling an artist, well, you sold out. You sold out to the city, to the Philistines, right? An unnatural life. It sounds as though from that view that that is the supreme insult, put down. That's the individual level, but then look, to be civilized, the second part of this, I point out, to be considered an intellectual of the realm, that is, over in the city, you have got to continually, or when it's appropriate, which is going to be fairly, somewhat periodical, Lee, <laughs> periodical, you are going to find something to criticize about life. As I say, if you didn't, you fall outside the mainstream. You just, you have to. You can say, well, I got nothing against modern technology except... I don't know, it's gone too far. Yeah. It's gotten unnatural. Yeah, that's what I meant. It's just, you know, a little progress is all right, but damn, you know, we got to you know, stop this over here. When you don't, I guess it was hard enough, not me beating it right at the end, but just think yourself, assuming that you followed some of this, an ordinary mind. Your ordinary mind, just any ordinary view, once you're called up, there you sit in traffic. You've forgotten all this tonight, and you're sitting there in traffic tomorrow. Somebody kind of bumps your fender. Somebody blows their horn. Somebody goes by and gives you the finger. A car in front of you is just pouring such bad exhaust smoke out that you're prone to take down his number and call the authorities and report him. <laughs> that kind of thing that is you, you holding people responsible for the civilized world, and you might even kind of drift off and think, Oh, that lake house, if I could just afford to move back where my grandparents used to live up in Vermont, just get out there with the mountains and the birds and get away from this, I don't know, just this unnatural life. <laughs> it's that men are holding other men responsible, and men will even hold themselves responsible of the civilized part. How else do you explain that people will voluntarily go see a damn priest or a psychiatrist or go a marriage counselor? You know why? Is you believe that, well... I'm part of the technological age, but I don't know. I've gotten, I don't know, too technical. I'm beginning to live an unnatural life, which is another, I know they don't use it, I don't think, but that's a clinical synonym, or it should be, in the psychiatric biz, for a neurosis. I'm unnatural, which is kind of self-defeating and funny once you understand that if you've got a neurosis, you're not unnatural. 
I was pointing out, it's a sign that you're probably more civilized, more sophisticated than some guy down the street. And you go, you meet him out walking the street someday, and he's near the neighborhood, and you say, I have a psychosis. And the best he can do is go, I think I have a small polyp on my liver. And you say, <laughs> and you make a mental note, you know, not to invite him over to the, the next block party, or you hope you don't run across him and his kids at the PTA meeting. Uh, let me see if I can wrap it in a, two minutes, or not wrap it, but one other thing. Do you realize that if you could see, if I'm giving you a valid, usable description, which I am, so we can quit playing with our hint and I suggest, that the very thing that seems to be unnatural is opposed to the natural world. That is, man's invented post-survival world that for one, from one view is unnecessary. As we've all been through, that you could do away with technology, you could do away with all civilization, and more or less we'll assume that physically, some of us could live a few more years, at least by killing the rest of them. If, if we couldn't do any better, you'd kill the rest and eat them and take whatever they got. So you could live without civilization for a while, you individually and large groups of people collectively, as proved by certain areas of this planet at this moment. But that's another story. If you saw that the very things that would seem to be undeniably fit fodder for criticism, things with which you cannot fail to find insightful fault with. <laughs> with which you cannot fail to find insightful fault then. <laughs> that those very things are not to be seen, once you understand, once you see it for yourself, they are not to be seen, they are not to be judged by any different standard than a tree, than the song of a robin, than the sight of a mountain. And that none of that seems perforce by its own definition. None of those things seem unnatural. You may not be in love with birds. You may not be a budding ornithologist. <laughs> but again, you have got to be outside the mainstream. If you're sane, you cannot find fault with what appears to be the world not touched by man. The natural world you cannot find in any way, to any degree, anything comparis in comparison, the same kind of fault with that than you can the things that man does. The fashions he comes up with, his music, his art, his politics, anything that you do not naturally find out there in the woods. It just happened to fall together and there it is. What would that do if you did see that it is a continual organic growth as natural, as organic? If anybody has any doubt, uh, go get a good dictionary if I didn't tell you enough. What the full organic, just the same way that a tree grows from an acorn. The same way that a field that sprouts out after it got burned down, a few little Twigs come up and a few little pieces of grass and something, and it just grows. And you just stand there, you come back, and there it, it continues to expand, develops, it gets higher, more complex. That is civilization also. It grows just as organically. But that's not the end of it. Even though that's true and people do not see it, ordinary men, contrary to not only not seeing it, they must then, to be considered part of the sophisticated intellectual realm of that life, they must continually kick their own selves. They must find fault with the very thing that they invented from their view. And a viewer just wrote and says, that's sort of interesting. But they also said that they were glad the tape was over for the night so it didn't have to think about it anymore. <laughs> hey, you smart-ass viewer. Oh, 